All right. Um, all right. Thank you guys for coming. I'm just admitting a few more people in here. Um, today we are presenting on the right to cure and multiple representation. Uh, last week we um, touched on the right to cure, actually went into it in depth when we covered the inspection contingency. Um, we, Joni and I really wanted to make sure um, that we were thoughtful in what we were presenting on right after uh, Accelerator. So I'm not sure how many of you were in Accelerator last week, um, but you went over, should have gone over the offer to purchase and the um, buyer agency agreement last week with Kathleen. So you guys definitely went over to Right to Cure then, and you went over multiple representation then as well. Um, but these are definitely the most misunderstood concepts in our contracts. So um, we just really want to go over it even more in depth um, with you guys. Take any questions on this specifically. Um, again, many more people. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions as I'm going through this as always. Um, and then afterwards, well, there'll be time to go over more questions, excuse me. And then just general questions as well, because we like to open this up for an open forum um, for general questions from you guys as well. So, all right. Um, so the right to cure. And as I said, um, definitely the most misunderstood concepts. Um, so this means, you know, whether you're brand new in this business, or a very well seasoned agent, um, these concepts trip people up all the time. So you'll you will find yourself with questions on these as you go through your transactions, as you start writing contracts, um, and then even as you come into new situations as it relates to these. Um, there's just many different pathways, for example, that the right to cure can take. So you'll always have questions on this stuff. So. Um, all right, the right to cure. Um, the con main contingencies, the contingencies that the right to cure is attached to our inspection, um, the appraisal contingency, the general testing and radon testing contingencies, um, the well inspection contingency, the well water testing uh, contingency, and the private sanitary system inspection contingency. Um, we're going to really more focus on um, inspection and appraisal uh, today. Um, I went over inspection last week, um, and then we'll see how the appraisal and what to cure is worded this week. Um, the concept of the right to cure. So, um, I always say this when I'm training on this as well, that it's really hard to, uh, I think, explain these to a client um, because right to cure might not ever be triggered in the purchase. So sometimes it's hard to go down this road of um, how you want to explain it to your client because again, it might not ever come up in a deal. We hope it never comes up in a deal. Um, so just be mindful of that um, when you are kind of working out your scripts with the clients on and how you're explaining this to a client. Um, so again, the, not the right to cure is only ever triggered when a notice um, of defects in the case of an inspection contingency or a notice is served um, as it relates to the appraisal contingency. And we'll go over that. Um, so it may never be triggered in an offer. <laughs> Hopefully, um, our first goal is always to negotiate, 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 and hopefully uh, it never comes down to a uh, notice being served. Um, so again, it might not ever be triggered. Um, ultimately, the concept of right to cure, it determines who has the power to declare the offer null and void in an offer. So um, if the seller has the right to cure in the offer to purchase or uh, within this con or within whatever contingency it's been attached to, um, if the seller has been given the right to cure, that means that they have the authority to declare the offer null and void. 
Um, if the seller has not been given the right to cure, then the buyer has the power to declare the offer null and void. Um, as a buyer's agent, it's definitely more advantageous for uh, the seller not to have the right to cure. So that gives that buyer the unilateral power to just serve that notice and get out of the deal. Um, right now, we are writing uh, offers. Um, it's more common for us to give the seller the right to cure in our offers this year and years in the most recent years. Um, just because of this strong competitive market, um, we are seeing that the seller has been giving the given the right to cure. Um, so it's more advantageous for the seller to have that. And we'll show you why. All right, um, so the most common place that this plays out um, is definitely within the inspection contingency. So um, when you're choosing and opting for that buyer to have a, an inspection contingency, um, the next determination is whether or not the seller will have the right to cure. Um, again, if you give the if you do not give the seller the right to cure, um, and the um, it is found that the let me get a lot more people in here. Sorry. So line 216, this is where you're determining whether or not the seller will have the right to cure. If the seller is not given the right to cure and a notice of defects is served, um, that means buyer has had the uh, their general home inspection. They have found out that there is something, the inspect that general home inspection revealed there is something um, so significant that the buyer does not want to uh, proceed with the offer. They did not give the seller the right to cure. They can serve that notice of defects. We'll say it's an example. We'll give the example that there is a bad foundation. Um, that buyer can serve a notice of defects stating that they object to the condition of the foundation and the offer is hereby null and void. If the seller has been given the right to cure, that taking that same, oh, was there a question? Okay, I'll continue. Um, taking that same example of um, a foundation defect, if the seller has been given the right to cure, buyer and seller attempt to negotiate on it. There's a breakdown in negotiations. Buyer says to seller, um, I object to the condition of the foundation, serves that notice of defects. Now the seller has the option to, do, to, to decide yes, I will cure those defects um, and keep you in the deal, Mr. Buyer. So, um, oh. so I'm just gonna read through it as well. Um, line 216, right to cure, seller shall or shall not, you're gonna strike one, um, shall if neither is stricken. So if you forget to strike it, it will default to the seller Get, have been given the right to cure the defects. Uh, line 217, if the seller has the right to cure, the seller may satisfy this contingency by delivering notice to buyer within blank days after buyer's delivery of the notice of defects stating the seller's election to cure the defects. Point two, they will cure the defects in a good and workmanlike manner. And we'll get to that phrase, good and workmanlike manner in a minute. Um, and three, delivering to buyer a written report detailing the work done no later than three days prior to closing. A couple of things that I wanna point out in this section. Um, if that, uh, if the buyer has delivered it on those of defects, um, we are now what I call the election to cure period. And the buyer, or now the seller has the determination to keep the buyer in the deal. Um, and elect to cure the defects, or they can not elect to cure the defects. Um, if the seller opts to cure the defects, they must communicate that back to the buyer with their own notice, as point one states. Um, we cannot just receive an email from the listing agent saying, we received your notice of defects, seller will cure, 
um, you know, will get you the proper paperwork as noted. They must send a notice back stating, oh, seller hereby elects to cure the defects. That's very important. Um, so I just want to make sure that I'm pointing that out to everybody. Um, moving on. Um, so curing the defects in a good and workmanlike manner. Um, the seller then has to has to cure the defects, fix the defects, cure the defects, repairs, excuse me, um, in a good and workman. <laughs> this phrase, good and workmanlike manner, we have found um, that in of itself is a very vague phrase. Um, as a buyer's agent, we can include language to um, make that more specific in case we do get down to this and seller is curing defects. Um, we can make sure that it's done in a way that the um, buyer is a little bit more protected. And I will, again, show you guys that in a minute. Um, then three, delivering to buyer written report detailing the work done no later than three days prior to closing. So if there are five repairs that that seller needs to make, they need to um, provide these reports to the buyer. Um, and again, no later than three days prior to closing. And then at the final walkthrough, the buyer will take these reports and determine that these defects were cured as stated. Line 222. Um, so this spells out um, how the offer would be null and void. So this offer shall be null and void if buyer makes timely delivery of the notice of defects and written inspection reports. And one seller does not have the right to cure. So as I have already stated, um, or the seller has the right to cure, but the seller elects not to cure. So uh, point A there. Or B, seller does not timely deliver the written notice of election to cure. So in that 10-day um, period, that election to cure period, if the seller receives that notice of defects and does nothing, does not send a notice back, um, just <laughs> passage of time automatically means that the offer is null and void um, due to the fact that the buyer, the seller did not communicate in a timely manner. Uh, yeah, that's, that's come up a couple of times in phone calls that I received <clears throat> that the seller just didn't respond and the buyer didn't, the buyer kept asking, the buyer's agent kept asking the listing agent, you know, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? What are they going to do? The seller mm -hmm. had right to cure, but didn't respond. And when I, when they called, I said, it's over. I mean, it's not, he doesn't always have to send a notice saying he's not going to cure. He can just wait out the expiration time and that contract is null and void. Yeah. Um, and then Regarding that time period, so if you notice on line 218, I wrote three to 10 days. Um, it defaults to 10 days if it's left blank. Um, in the old offer to purchase forms, it was automatically 10 days. Um, as a buyer's agent, you might wanna consider tightening up that timeline um, because in the example that Joni just mentioned, if, if a buyer's waiting 10 <clears throat> days for a seller to decide whether or not they're gonna cure defects and ultimately they do not cure it, um, the buyer may have missed out on an opportunity to write on something else. So right. as a buyer's agent, you might wanna tighten up that timeline and only give them maybe three to five days to determine whether or not they're gonna cure. So yeah, um, remember it has to be a specific number of days, not a range. Yes, I, yes, thank you. Um, okay. So again, um, I did not obviously include the entire verbiage of the inspection contingency, but only the right to cure piece of it. Um, but does anybody have questions on this so far? And we're gonna go back and practice and, and talk about how this all works out in practice again. So I'm probably will be repeating myself a lot. So I apologize, <laughs> but <laughs> really wanna hammer this home. Important. Okay. It's important. Um, all right, so the appraisal contingency and the right to cure. So um, this doesn't 
come up too much. I mean, right secured rarely gets triggered, I, I have found in the appraisal contingency, um, but it is attached to the appraisal contingency. Um, so um, as we all know how the appraisal contingency works, um, the uh, buyer will opt to have an appraisal contingency, their lender, um, or if it's a cash offer, they can still have an appraisal contingency as well. Um, but the lender will order the appraisal. That's typically how this is happening. The lender orders the appraisal as part of the loan process. Um, a third party person comes out and um, their sole job is making sure that um, the lender is not um, lending more than, on the home than the home is worth. Um, so it's a protection for the bank. Um, if that appraisal, that appraisal report needs to come back um, at the um, purchase price or higher. Um, if the appraisal value comes in lower than that purchase price on the offer to purchase, um, that's when further negotiations can happen. And it's at this point where right to cure could ultimately be triggered. So, um, so again, you're going to opt on line 315, whether or not the seller will have the right to cure as it comes, as it relates to the appraisal contingency. Um, same deal, if nothing is stricken, it is automatically defaulted to the seller having the right to cure. And again, works the same way. It gives, um, it determines who has the power to declare the offer null and void. Um, so I'll just go ahead and read it, line 316. So if the seller has the right to cure, uh, the seller may satisfy this contingency by delivering written notice to buyer adjusting the purchase price to the value shown on the appraisal report within five days after the buyer's delivery of the appraisal report and the notice objecting to the appraised value. So that buyer receives their appraisal report, let's say it comes in $10,000 lower than that um, offer to purchase price. Um, they can send a notice objecting to the value of the appraisal report um, and uh, along with a copy of the appraisal report to the seller. Um, and now the seller um, has the option to say, you know what, I'm not going to come down that $10,000. I'm going to let you out of the deal, Mr. Buyer. Um, or they can keep the buyer in the deal and say, yes, I will come down uh, to the appraised value and you must move forward with the deal. Um, so let's say- um, Yeah, Steph, about I wanna interject right now. We just have a situation <clears throat> with one of our agents um, where within that five days or whatever that time frame was, the uh, buyer's agent did not send a notice. The appraisal came in very, very low. The uh, buyer's agent did not send a notice. They sent an amendment. Well, first they sent an email to the listing agent saying the um, appraisal was low. And then they sent an amendment suggesting a different price so instead of sending the notice saying you had to come to the appraisal price, she bypassed that by saying it's low, but I'm not, she didn't send a notice, she sent an amendment, so let's negotiate a price. Mm -hmm. And I found that pretty unique um, <clears throat> way of dealing with it. And actually three or four amendments went back and forth between the buyer and the seller. Uh, within that five days or whatever that time limit was. So they, um, it didn't automatically kick out the offer. And I thought it was a pretty smart way of doing it. They eventually negotiated into an agreed upon price. Yeah. Um, but um, didn't really follow the right to cure situation. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, same way with the inspection contingency, you know, if you, if you as a buyer's agent receive an appraisal report that comes in lower than the purchase price, you can attempt to um, negotiate the price first and, and ask them first, will you come down that full amount? Um, 
And then if the seller says no, then at that point you could force their hand with a notice of defects. Right. Um, but the same way with the inspection contingency, if that deadline for the appraisal contingency comes and goes and nothing has been resolved, the buyer is buying it as is. And um, if nothing happens or nothing gets worked out with that low appraisal report or that low appraisal value, um, they are still on the hook for paying the full purchase price and covering the difference. Um, so it's really important to, you know, if, if nothing happens in your negotiations, um, same way with the inspection, <clears throat> you're down to your last day, you need to get that notice delivered um, so that this new deadline gets triggered. So in this case, it would be that five days. Um, Okay, uh, so continuing on with the language in the contract. So seller and buyer agree to promptly execute an amendment initiated by either party after the delivery of seller's notice solely to reflect the adjusted purchase price. Uh, this offer shall be null and void if the buyer makes timely delivery of the notice objecting to the appraised value and the written appraisal report and seller does not have the right to cure. So again, ball is in buyer's court to just declare the offer null and void if they, um, get that appraisal report back, it's too low. Um, and let's say they just decide, you know what? I'm not even gonna ask the seller to come down. I just, I'm gonna use this to get out of the deal because I, I want to anyway. So they have that choice 100% if they did not give the seller the right to cure. Oh. Um, the offer is null and void if the seller has the right to cure but and seller delivers written notice that the seller will not adjust the purchase price. Um, or B, same deal with the inspection contingency, seller does not timely deliver the written notice adjusting the purchase price to the value shown on the appraisal report. Um, so again, kind of coming through the lens of being a buyer's agent, um, you know, the most protection for your seller when you're writing as a buyer's agent would be not to give the seller the right to cure um, these are all conversations that you're going to be going to be having with your buyer, of course, as you um, are writing and, and drafting the offer with them. Um, but any any opportunity that a seller, or I'm sorry, any opportunity that a buyer can just declare the offer null and void, obviously, is more um, to their advantage um, in terms of writing the uh, the most protective offer for a buyer. So. Um, I have found, oh, I think I have a raised hand here. Did anyone have a question? <clears throat> yes. Um, hi, my name is Coburn. Um, the question I had, um, fairly new agent question. So is there a, um, I guess like after you get the appraisal, um, is there a safe amount? Uh, how can I ask it? Um, what is, what is a what is an amount from an appraisal that you would actually send the right to cure um, notice being if you still want to stay competitive if if your client still kind of wants the house you kind of get what I'm saying like yeah it's three, it's three thousand dollars worth sending it sending the right to cure or you know how do you play that out well, it's all it's all the buyer's um, financial situation. So, you know, if you get a low appraisal back, you know, the conversation back to your buyer is this came in, let's say we'll take that $3,000. This came in $3,000 lower, um, you know, and that initial conversation, I should say, um, could be between the lender and the buyer and, and the lender might ask them, this came in low. <laughs> do you want to cover the difference? Do you want to, um, you know, cause the, the buyer could possibly cover the difference between the appraised value and the offer to purchase price. Um, and, and if they can't, then it, then that's when it's, um, you know, going back to the seller and saying, um, and then the next question, excuse me, I'm going to back up. The next question could be, all right, can you cover half of this? You know, sometimes buyer and seller will meet in the middle. Um, I've, seen that, I've seen that be the solution many times. Um, but if the, if the buyer just absolutely financially cannot bring that gap 
uh, between the appraised value and the purchase price, then, then that's when a notice has to be served and saying, you know, you have to come down, Mr. Seller, otherwise I cannot move forward with this. So there's not really a, a <clears throat> dollar amount answer I can give to that. It's, it's purely situational, um, depending on what the buyer can and cannot do. So I understand. Um, that, that makes perfect sense. I guess, yeah. I guess the real trick is knowing, you know, rather to give the right to cure in the first place within the contract. Um, you know, it's, this one is the appraisal contingency, you know, it, it, there's not as much weight in this as there is, I would say, with a inspection contingency, you know, and I'm sure Joni would agree that most, most often you're probably giving the right to cure and an appraisal contingency because the question back to a buyer is if the appraisal comes in low and seller's willing to come down and keep you in the deal, would you be okay with that? And most buyers are like, yeah, absolutely. You know, on the other hand, with an inspection contingency, there might be some, you know, with first time buyers, especially there might be something so large that a buyer might think to themselves, even if the buyer, even if the seller was willing to, to take this on and fix this for us, I don't know that we're comfortable moving forward, you know? So that's kind of where um, I would say it's a, it's a bigger uh, question, bigger consideration when it comes to the inspection contingency and right to cure than I would say for appraisal. Yeah, I, agree. I do have a question on the appraisal though. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, of course, thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, quick question. Um, so say for instance that my buyer offered 215, it came at 203, which it did happen. And I sent in the notice um, and I brought that 215 to 203. And I got a phone call from the agent uh, saying, would my buyer agree to you know, meet halfway? If, and my buyer said, no, absolutely not. And if the seller at that point, well, the seller did come down all the way to the 203, but if the seller did not want to, my buyer can always walk away and say, forget it, right? I'm not going over that 203. Yeah, them so, okay. So if the notice was served and they had to come down to that 203 and the seller, it, it's in the seller's court to decide um, if they can't come to, if they can't meet halfway and we're not willing to come down to 203, then we'll have to let that buyer out of the deal. So the okay. seller, the seller is going to have to let them out of the deal. Okay. And, and the seller does that with a written notice or just letting it that time expire <clears throat> on the right to cure. Okay. Can you explain so, more about 327 line? Oh, um, an executed FHA, VA, or USDA amendatory clause may supersede this contingency. So um, in those FHA amendatory clauses, um, it states that whether or not the buyer has given the right to cure to the seller on the, in this piece of, in this portion of the contract, um, those amendatory clauses, um, uh, seller, I'm sorry, excuse me, seller automatically does not have the right to cure. So meaning the buyer has the option to walk away no matter what. And so that's when it says that the, that clause may supersede this contingency because that language, even if the seller was given the right to cure in this section, those amendatory clauses um, automatically give the buyer the option to walk away if the, if the appraisal contingency comes in lower, oh, sorry, appraisal value comes in lower. Okay. But the seller can take the difference. Yeah. In a FHA or BA. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's just giving that buyer more power a choice right? yeah okay um okay good questions any other questions so far the buyer was transferring here and thought that the company oh who's Is this christian can't hear you very well He might have been on the phone with somebody else. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So next slide. 
um, in practice. So um, going back, well, this is this applies to both the inspection and appraisal contingencies, of course, um, and testing. Um, but in practice, as I had stated in the very beginning, um, you know, we hope that a notice of defects is never served. We're hoping that buyer and seller can come to a meeting of the minds via an amendment and negotiate their way through any um, issues that arise as a result of um, an inspection or a, a low appraisal. So um, your default is not to serve that notice of defects right away. Um, many people um, I have found, many agents I have found um, or get the question that because they gave the seller the right to cure, that notice of defects needs to be drafted um, if there's an issue. And that is not true. Um, your buyers, and we'll, we'll discuss in terms of the inspection contingency, your buyers should always be going to the seller first and asking um, for those repairs to be done. Um, and the conversation always with your buyer is, you know, they can agree to some, none, or all of these um, requests. Um, and then it's at that point, uh, depending on how the seller responds, um, and this is my opinion, um, depending on whether or not the seller responds, if that notice of defects is going to be served or not. Um, so um, again, your first line of attack is always an amendment with requests before that notice of defects is served. Um, back to um, good and workmanlike manner. So, um, and as I stated last week, this, this is kind of hard to also kind of go through with a buyer because we might never even come to this point. Um, but let's say there is a notice of defects served. Let's say the seller does opt to cure the defects. Um, now we've got this term good and workmanlike manner. Um, that is very vague for a buyer. Um, so in our clause library, um, we have um, included language and you can see it here, but um, it's kind of expanding on this idea of good and workmanlike manner. So sellers shall have the right to cure in a good and workmanlike manner using, and this is where we get more detailed um, and expanding on this workmanlike using professional licensed experts for the benefit of permit as required and in accordance with municipal building code and generally accepted construction and safety standards. Scope of work shall be uh, defined by independent third party expert. Um, so again, this is just protecting the buyer so that, you know, let's say this plumbing repair has to be done. It's not uh, Uncle Joe, the handyman, making these uh, repairs. It's it's a licensed plumber making these repairs um, if it comes down to that um, seller electing to cure defects, okay? Um, so as a buyer's agent, we strongly suggest adding that into um, the offer to purchase. And if you guys have questions about where to find the clause library in zip forms, please let me know. Um, but there, there's a lot of uh, language that you can use um, as it relates to other uh, pieces of the contract. So, okay, any questions? Okay. All right, multiple representation. Um, so another um, concept in our contracts that um, is misunderstood. Um, and, you know, depending on uh, who is holding the listing, this might not ever come into play. If we're Keller Williams agents writing on a Coldwell Banker property, uh, this concept of multiple representation does not come into play because we're writing on a, a completely different firm's uh, listing. Um, it's so let me go through. Um, and again, you would have found this language um, when you guys were going over the buyer agency contracts last week with Kathleen. Um, multiple representation is also uh, addressed in our listing contracts. So this uh, is a concept between um, the firm and our clients. So not between 
buyer and seller, but the firm. <coughs> and the so um, multiple representation, it only applies when the same firm is involved on both sides of the transaction. Um, so I'm going to use Joni and I, um, if I have a buyer and I'm writing on one of Joni's listings, um, then this multiple representation comes into play. Uh, both agents of the same firm will have representation agreements with their clients. So you guys made the distinction last week and in your pre-licensing coursework, the distinction between client versus customer. Um, so you only have a client, um, they're only a client in the transaction if there's a listing contract signed or a buyer agency contract in place, um, making those once customers clients of the firm. Um, so if they're using that same example with Joni and I, if I have a buyer who I am writing um, and I'm writing the offer as an agent of the seller, they're my customer, then this multiple representation concept does not even apply in that case as well. This is only if both sides have a listing contract in place and a buyer agency contract in place. Uh, as I said before, might never apply in the transaction. Um, we're going to go over um, what it means to have with designated agency and without designated agency. Um, we're going to discuss how all clients must agree to the same multiple representation designation. Um, and all clients must consent to um, multiple representation as well. So some clients could opt out altogether. Um, clients may change their uh, multiple representation designation midpoint as well in the uh, <clears throat> during the transaction, and we can discuss where that might come into play. So multiple representation again, multiple representation relationship exists if a firm has an agency agreement with more than one client who is a party in the same transaction. If you and the firm's other clients in the transaction consent, the firm may provide services through designated agency, which is one type of multiple representation relationship, which we'll get into. So with designated agency, um, designated agency means that different agents with the firm <laughs> will negotiate on behalf of you and the other client or clients in the transaction and the firm's duties to you as a client will remain the same. I'm gonna continue. Each agent will provide information, opinions and advice to the client for whom the agent is negotiating um, to assist the client in the negotiations. Um, each client will be able to receive information, opinions and advice that will assist the client even if the information, opinions or advice gives the client advantages in the negotiations over the firm's other clients. Um, an agent will not reveal any of your confidential information to another party unless required to do so by law. So with designated agency. So when we are, um, back to Joni and I. Um, so if I have a buyer client and my buyer client was okay with having designated agency, if there's a multiple representation um, situation, um, and we go ahead and we write on Joni's <clears throat> listing, listing, or Joni has a, a client relationship obviously with her seller because she has a listing contract with them. Um, what this means is that I, as my buyer's designated agent, um, will be able to negotiate and give advice for my client and um, go into, <laughs> I like to say as a, as I pulled from Joni, excuse me, um, I can go into the boxing ring for my buyer. Joni is her, the designated agent for her seller in this case. And she has the same level of re representation to her seller as I do with my buyer. Um, so she can negotiate on behalf of her seller um, and she can give um, advice and opinions to her seller as well. And she is going into the boxing ring with me on behalf of her seller. So her and I are in that boxing ring duking it out, um, duking this transaction out, this offer out, um, fighting and advocating for our clients. Okay. Without designated agency. Um, if a chat, 
What happens if you have buyer's agency agreement and you bring that person to your listing? We're gonna go over that now. Thank you for that question. Um, so without designated agency, what this means. So if a designated agency relationship is not authorized by you or your or other clients in the transaction, you may still authorize or reject a different type of multiple representation relationship in which the firm may provide brokerage services to more than one client in a transaction, but neither the firm nor any of its agents may assist any client with information, opinions, and advice, which may favor the interests of one client over any other client. Under this neutral approach, and here's where it, your question will be answered. The same agent may represent more than one client in a transaction. So if you have a, I'm gonna kind of flip this a bit. Let's say I have a listing, because um, this is where generally where this example comes up. If you have a listing and um, a buyer customer comes to you, um, or you happen to have, you know, you happen to already be working with a buyer client um, and you, you secure a listing that that buyer client may want, um, you can write the offer for that buyer, um, but you must do so in this without designated agency capacity. So you are completely neutral between your buyer client and your seller client. Um, and that, in that regard, you may write on <coughs> your own listing or have a buyer. Yes. In that regard, yeah. you may <coughs> write on your own. I had a, <coughs> excuse me. I had a call this morning from one of our agents, <coughs> excuse me, who just listed a property. Uh, the seller is a good friend of his, got it listed, and he had an open house Sunday and a buyer walked in <coughs> and was very interested in the um, <clears throat> property. Um, and the buyer <clears throat> was savvy enough to want representation. So our agent signed a buyer agency with him and then explained to him as the buyer's agent, as his buyer's agent, and also as the seller's agent, it put him into what we call dual agency, multiple <clears throat> representation and the same agent is representing a buyer and a client and a seller and we call that dual agency and most of us that have been in the business a long time try to avoid dual agency at all costs mm -hmm. because it is very difficult for you at this point representing a seller to have to change your uh, position and be neutral with your seller, which is sometimes very difficult, and be neutral with the buyer who you have an agency relationship. You have to step back from both of them, say, I'll just give me the verbiage on your contract and your counter and your amendment order, and I'll just write it out and I'll present it to the other side. You lose all of your negotiating power with both clients. The best way to deal with this is either to designate another Keller Williams agent to represent one of these clients in designated agency, make sure that you both agree with that in your um, contracts, or you can convince one of your clients, usually the buyer, to become a customer in this situation. But obviously the better solution is to <clears throat> designate um, one of these clients to another Keller Williams agent. Uh, agent. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with <clears throat> a neutral approach because in my opinion, what are, what is the client paying for if they don't have the ability to have their agent <clears throat> give them advice, give them opinions, negotiate for them on their behalf? Um, I, I can't really wrap my head around doing both sides of something when neither party is going to benefit at all. Um, Plus, there are a lot of liability pitfalls in dual agency, which is right. another reason the company I was with before was part of their policy not to have the agents do dual agency mm -hmm. uh, because of the liability potential where they say you are representing him even though you shouldn't have been representing him in negotiations. Most 
buyers today and sellers, but especially buyers, understand the difference of being represented and not being represented or being a customer. And most consumers today want that representation. Mm -hmm. So you can't you can't do it if it's if you're on both sides. <clears throat> Um, and I think you made this comment before, Joni, just, I don't even really, it, it's really hard to take a neutral report. I mean, even, even the best intentioned agent, I think it would be impossible to be, to truly be neutral, um, in the transaction. So, um, the next slide, uh, complete rejection of multiple representation. <clears throat> so, if when you are going over the um, going over this with your clients, either your seller client or your um, buyer client, um, the client might choose that they completely reject the, the concept of multiple representation. Um, so if they do not consent to multiple representation um, relationship, the firm will not be allowed to provide any brokerage services to more than one client in the transaction. So what that means is as a listing, agent with a seller or client. And if the seller opts to reject multiple representation, that means you cannot accept any offers from any <clears throat> um, Likewise with a buyer client, if the buyer client is um, rejects multiple representation, that means that you lose the ability to write on a Keller Williams listing. Um, I've never seen any, any clients reject to it. Um, I think with proper education, they're going to come to understand that, um, you know, when I, when I'm explaining it to a client, for example, you know, I'm like nine times out of 10, it's going to be, if we write on another Keller Williams property, you know, that seller is going to work for them the same way that I'm able to work with you. If we come to an instance where, um, where, I happen to have both sides of it, then I will designate another agent um, to step in either on the seller or on your side, you know? So with proper education, again, um, most clients are going to, to opt for designated agency. Um, and then just to show you again, what it looks like. So um, this was probably the best thing that the um, WRA did. I don't even know how many years ago this was now, but um, they changed the language to make this more understandable for the consumer. Um, but when you're explaining this to a client, um, you, can, you can really just read these choices below to them and um, to help them understand um, what, they're, what they're choosing. So um, in designated agency, the same firm may represent me and the other party as long as the same agent is not representing us both. So that's multiple representation relationship with designated agency. Um, they may again choose without designated agency. So that's the second option. The same firm may represent me and the other party, but the firm must remain neutral regardless of one or more agents are involved. Um, so that's multiple representation relationship without designated agency. Um, and the same firm cannot represent both me and the other party in the same transaction. So that's a complete uh, rejection of multiple representation relationship. Um, I had said before um, that you can, that the client can change this option uh, midstream. Um, so let's say, you know, initially they choose that designated agency relationship. Um, and they come to, uh, you guys come to a situation where you are, you, you can bring both sides of it. And if after conversation, they are okay with that neutral approach, then you're gonna amend your uh, contracts and um, opt for the second uh, designation here without designated agency. So they could, these can always be changed. Um, Garen, oh, he's just saying he has to go. Um, is the firm, Tracy, is the firm all of Keller Williams or your specific market center? I thought each office was technically their own firm. Um, Joni, I'm gonna have you field that because I 
<clears throat> I don't. I, I would know. think it's, I would think for general purposes, it would be all Keller Williams. Yeah. Because you get down to the distinction of who owns what, maybe the <clears throat> general agent population doesn't know who owns what, or even the population within the firm actually knows who owns what. I think to be safe, a Keller Williams client is a Keller Williams client. And that's how I operate. Probably an yeah. easier, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, I don't know if this is my last slide. One second. Okay. Um, so in practice and best practices. So we've already discussed um, our best practice. So um, having, having someone step in regardless. So that's what I was going to comment on <clears throat> best practices when it comes to multiple representation. Um, so as a solo agent, the buy, have the buyer, um, and writing on low own listing. So without designated agency, we've already gone over that, um, writing on another KW's mm -hmm. agent listing, um, and then receiving an offer from, an, from another KW agent. So where I was going to expand on this is, um, uh, again, not taking that neutral approach, but but definitely designating another agent. Um, agent on a team. So if you are on a team or plan to be on a team, always consult with your team leader on this. Um, I know a lot of teams will automatically not allow for any neutral approach and um, they just have a general team policy that if both um, if the team brings both sides, but they will automatically designate an agent on the team to step in if it comes to a case where um, one of the agents can write on their own property. Um, I think that's my last slide. Yeah, I, I'd like to add something in here. Sometimes agents who've never been faced in this situation uh, are reluctant to designate another agent to a client, uh, say in a, um, where the agent is the um, listing agent and the buyer's agent for the same property. And when they call with their questions of what to do, I say, I think it's better to designate. Uh, they, they're unsure they wanna do that because they think they're giving up that side of the transactions commission. And it's not. Um, if you're on a team, uh, that sharing of uh, designation should be part of the team's structure. And that's where you ask the team leader, you know, how do we compensate a team member <clears throat> if we want to designate? If you're not on a team and you just need to select another Keller Williams agent to be the designated agent on how you compensate that person is totally between the two of you. Um, it can be a flat fee. It can be, if it's depending on the amount of work it's gonna entail, if it's just drafting the offer period, it can be a gift certificate to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a percentage of the, of the uh, buying commission if you designate it to the buyer side. <clears throat> but it doesn't necessarily have to mean you have to totally give up the commission on that side. You negotiate with your designated agent on how you compensate each other. Yeah. Um, okay. So as I said before, you're, there's always going to be questions on this. Um, and I, I'll be the first to admit, it took me a long time to really fully understand multiple representation and right to cure. Um, it, 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 again, since there's so many different pathways that it can take, it, it's just, it is hard to, um, grasp unless you start practicing and, and writing contracts and, and seeing how it all plays out. Um, so with that being said, are there any other questions, um, pertaining to this or just general contract questions? No. Okay, well, I appreciate everyone coming. We both do. So we'll see you next week. You did a great job, Steph. Thanks, Sheriff. <laughs>
<laughs> we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.